Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we'll get started. It's just one minute past the hour. More people will join us, um, I'm sure, in the next few minutes. Um, so thank you all for attending this AAA online briefing series on the AAA Tech Index, which was only made possible with the help of our valued member in Infotech. Eduardo uh, from Infotech will be taking you through the presentation today covering the key insights from the index. My name is Simon Bush and I'm the CEO of the AAA. It's an absolute pleasure to host this informative webinar covering the purchasing and hiring intentions of your customers, CIOs from government education and industry over the short and medium term. The AAA saw a gap in the market from analysts that are not providing a short term or current view of what technology decision makers are thinking and where they intend to spend their budget in the Australian market and what is impacting on those decisions. We wanna track this data. So this has been the inaugural first report. We aim to do one every six months and track the spend to create that index. Please note this event is being recorded and will be made available on the member portal and there'll be opportunities for questions. So please use the Q&A function in the bottom toolbar uh, in the webinar and we'll take questions at the end. I'll also explain at the close how you can get a full copy of the index and the report. Let us uh, begin today by recognising the tens of thousands of years of innovation that has been handed down through the generations from the original custodians of the various lands upon which we meet today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians and pay my respects to elders past and present. With that, I'd now like to hand over to Eduardo uh, to take us through the AWA Tech Index. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you, Simon, and good morning to everyone. Um, my name is uh, Eduardo Daud, Ed for short. I'm an executive counselor at Infotech. Uh, Infotech Research Group is uh, the fastest growing research and advisory firm. We're helping 30,000 IT and technology leaders to uh, make timely, strategic, and well-informed decisions. So we partnered with, with uh, AIIA and uh, created this um, first of a series of index that we will be building over time. And the intention for today is just to cover this and give you the highlights. So a bit of a uh, understanding and insights from the, the results that we saw. So I'll be sharing my screen. <clears throat> and hopefully that is coming okay. Yep. Yes, that's working well, thanks, Ed. Perfect. So please, uh, as Simon mentioned, just please uh, ask questions throughout the presentation. I'll just go as fast as possible, and then we will be answering as many as we can at the end. And if needed, we can just uh, reach out to you afterwards too. So basically what we'll be covering today is uh, key priorities um, and then purchasing intent and then something around IT talent, which will be the, the main themes of the the report that we, we put together. So to start with uh, key priorities. So the first first point is, uh, this is our uh, Infotex uh, maturity model, and we use this around all, all the research that we do. It helps us understand and put a bit of context around uh, what we're seeing in the data. So keep this in mind, it's a bit of setting the scenes with everything that you will see afterwards will have a bit of this baked into it. And uh, this is the shape of where people answering to this uh, uh, survey were, uh, were positioning themselves in terms of IT maturity. And the, the, the first highlight you can see and, and read through the different levels of maturity, uh, you will start from struggling and just keeping the lights on and being a, a bit of a firefighter to supporting the business, then optimizing that over time expand and transform will be at the higher end and what we call high maturity or those those two sections that is uh, moving from a cost center more into a, um, a center of revenue so you're starting to deal with revenue generating initiatives and then transforming business models with the business so uh, as a subset of uh, this what we can see as a main highlight here is uh, two in three so uh, that's a quite significant chunk will be in that optimize and support, right? Uh, so keep that in mind because it's uh, that maturity will also drive some of the decisions that they need to make uh, because it will still be focusing on modernizing their IT and their processes too, right? So that's key highlight to keep in mind and something that we currently we use uh, all the time. And to give you an example from uh, our latest um, uh, 
uh, tech trends and CIO priorities that we did for uh, for InfoTech and presented recently. To give you an example, how this how we use this in in practice is high. Uh, high uh, maturity or um, high performance, let's say, that are in that transform and expand, when you compare them against uh, the others, uh, when it comes to AI, as an example, they will be already in a stage that they have the data governance, uh, the high performance ones, they will have the data governance in place, and they will have the, the adoption of the big platforms that are offering AI off the shelf as, as options. So they were, are ready to start dealing with that as opposed to the rest that are probably still implementing those platforms and trying to get the data governance going. So the reality of where and how they can be adopting these new technologies is quite different and we see it in, in the data. So just keep that in mind for, for the rest of the presentation because that's quite quite important. Now we'll talk about the focus areas for, for each of the, the different, um, what, what we heard from them. Um, so the focus on digital transformation and cybersecurity is a, a key one. You can see the word, word cloud there. Um, and there's that adopting new technologies while keeping secure, that resilient transformation we're calling that. And the, the second theme is around modernization, as I mentioned not surprisingly, if they're struggling to get that maturity up. Uh, so modernizing, that means tech debt, uh, upgrading core systems, replacing legacy technology as another theme. The third one, and as I mentioned, data governance, especially for things like AI, um, it's it's key. It probably is key for both. So you will need to, uh, whatever level you are in terms of data governance, you need to up your game to be able to transform uh, and, and adopt these new technologies, but also to modernize both things. So those are the three themes that we're seeing. And now we'll, we'll check the areas of concern uh, for the CIOs that reply to this, to this survey. So uh, you can see cybersecurity being the first one. Uh, not surprising to see this, uh, but also probably just trying to read a bit more of why this is the case. And you can relate to many cases of cyber threats or attacks that we, we heard in the last couple of years. But also probably a very important factor here is um, because it's, it's linked to risk and boards will be monitoring risk very uh, closely. There is a lot of drive from boards to their technology teams on how to uh, improve that cyber. So cyber is clearly one of the big board topics that you can find. So unsurprising that you will see this as a year of concern for the next 12 months. And then probably this is where this is very interesting. And uh, so the two other very high uh, areas are the customer. So the demands or behaviors changing from the customer side and government regulation. So government regulation and then industry regulation. So you have those two very close uh, there in the list. Um, and it's interesting to see how that and also how government regulation can also be affecting cyber. So cyber being up is also probably influenced, influenced by that government uh, regula re regulatory changes. But this being so high in, in that uh, regard is probably one of the big th trends to monitor and see what are those regulations? Uh, how can these uh, technology leaders adapt to that and how others can help them, right? So. Uh, that's a key area, and probably as a if you think about the forces in play, competition doesn't seem to be as much as an important factor for um, concern, right? So you can see uh, competitors and new entrants being, I wouldn't say not important, but they're quite significantly down that list, right? So main focus is on customers and government as forces and concerns. Now purchasing intent, which is uh, the next topic. Uh, this is a, a quite strong increase that is anticipated in terms of budgets and headcounts for the, the next uh, the next years. Uh, and it's quite significant, especially we're seeing well inflation also going down. So uh, this is not CPI driven as there was a strong influence. Of course, there's still some inflation, but we're seeing well above inflation figures here, right? This is a significant increase. Um, and and you can see how this, if you add the the two columns at the at the right, uh, you have fifty five percent that are expecting to get ten or more percentage of of increase for the next years. 
which is significant. And 36% will be in that category of 10% uh, or more increase in headcount too, right? So, and that goes hand in hand. A little bit less in headcount comparing to budget, right? Um, I can't read too much into that, but still a strong increment in terms of headcount too. Now, just to point out something, we don't have time to go into a, a lot of the drill downs into this, but there is a, some significant difference when you go into industries. And, uh, and some of the numbers, for example, to give you an example, education will be an area that is uh, quite different in terms of, of the behaviors that we're seeing here. Uh, so if you take this 10 to 29% increase, for example, for education, that here is a 42% increase uh, of, of the participants are expecting 10 to 29% increase. Uh, for education, this same bar is 20%, right? So it's a significantly less number for education. And in this 30% increase, uh, you don't find anyone in education, right? So this areas of uh, strong increase will be mostly in government and a bit on other industries. So just keep that in mind that although there is an increment depending on who you're talking to and the reality is something worth checking too. Um, now, in terms of headcount, probably the other thing to, to uh, consider is from a headcount increase, uh, this 7.9 that you see here of 30% or more, which is significant, you can only find that in government, right? So headcount increase, strong, very strong headcount increases only in government. We don't find this in, in uh, private sector or education. So next is, uh, well, where that is being planned on, on being spent, right? So what are the, the areas of, of spending that are planned here? So net new spend, and here's the, the five category, uh, technologies for net new spend, uh, AI being first, right? So I don't think that's a surprise to anyone either. Um, now, this is a bit lower than what we're seeing in other regions, right? So just keep in mind that uh, Australia will probably it's not moving as fast as other regions in terms of uh, additional or new net new spend on, on AI, um, but still it's it's high. And probably the, the other thing to consider here is uh, low code and, and uh, no code and low code platforms. Just thinking of that maturity and how do you uh, modernize probably all technologies that you might need to, to modernize, this would be some technology that could be helping there. Uh, as APIs too that are here, right? So something that probably microservices and APIs, and this is already in play. So additional spend also quite significant here. So this is the technologies receiving, um, so the technologies receiving additional spend. Sorry, I was pointing here, right? APIs here. Uh, the cybersecurity being the, the main one and that's, that's growing, as, as you know. Uh, but yes, APIs being something that is also quite uh, high up, and I will be linking that to digital transformation and modernization. Um, next, we'll see a bit about adoption. And, uh, and this is a bit more granular. I won't go into all the details, but uh, you can see how uh, cloud, AI, machine learning, big data are the ones that have the, the score of four and uh, above four uh, in terms of uh, adoption. And this is from four to, to seven, right? Um, and so this customer expectations, as we mentioned, being some concern, probably that could be driving, uh, driving this too. And then the, the driving uh, business efficiencies, which, which is the other one that you will need to, to be adopting here. Um, so that, that's probably a bit too granular and more to read uh, into the full report if you want to see more, but that's uh, something to consider too. And in terms of buying decisions for the next two years, so this is more specific things that they're planning. So this will be very likely named projects that are in play at the moment. Uh, and you have, and here you have the breakdown between the next 12 months and next year, basically. Uh, and cyber and cloud, both in both uh, sections are highly important, right? Uh, cyber this year being first and second next year, but both are go hand in hand as areas of uh, a lot of focus and decisions that will be made in those areas. Uh, now, I would, wanted to pay a bit of attention to this other two that is human resources or HRIS, and especially this year, because that drops down for the next year, 
Uh, and just keep this in mind while we discuss uh, later on the um, hybrid uh, workforce or remote uh, workforce, because I think this might be linked to some of the, the needs that are uh, coming up there. Uh, but then ERPs, the, the one that goes up significantly from this year, so you see here 18% to 31%. So it's getting close to cybersecurity, right, next year. Um, and, and I know I'm discussed with, with CIOs every week, and I know some big platforms that are sunsetting their products and it's driving some decisions. ERPs being something that uh, probably it's not the, the uh, most, um, um, I would say, favorite pro project to present to a CEO and probably something you want to defer as much as you can. But... Uh, there's a point in time that you need to do them, right? And it looks like next year is a year that things will need to get moving. But these things take time. So I wouldn't be surprised that the discussion starts now uh, and will be kind of getting real next year in terms of spend. So uh, decision-making, and I found this really fascinating. So how, how these IT leaders are deciding uh, their, their purchasing, their, 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 how they buy. And uh, it's significantly skewed towards uh, understanding my business, right? So 45% are saying that understanding the business is the number one factor by far, right? And, and I would say if you're, uh, yeah, if you're looking for uh, partners, if you add to that thinking of a local partner that can help you, uh, data sovereignty, and local support, right? If you add those two, it's 65%. So if you think of uh, a strong local partner that understands that business really well, that will be a, a significant advantage uh, compared to others, right? So that's a, a very strong point to, to consider. The other one is on discretionary budget. Uh, that is extremely low. So um, you can see that four in 10 uh, say that they have close to no discretionary budget, right? So most of it is already earmarked and it has a purpose and uh, they can just change their budgets in, in any significant way. Um, one in five will say that they have 10 to 20% 20, 20 of their budget that is discretionary. So just keep that in mind in terms of decision-making and uh, where, where you can move something that is already planned, probably... Not much, right? So things need to have uh, a purpose and be already signed off somehow to to go ahead. Uh, so talent is the the last section, um, and with this, I think it's uh, understanding which skills are in demand and the strategies that we we are seeing to address those gaps, right? Um, and lastly, we'll talk about uh, hybrid work for a bit. So uh, skills in demand. This is already linked to everything we saw so far, cybersecurity and data is also a very, uh, very highly demanded uh, skill that we have here. Um, and the, the um, uh, areas to consider here is everyone is considering some increment in headcount. We saw that before, and there will be a lot of competition here. So the, the strategies on how to source this talent will be one of the key things to consider. We we came from a, a bit of a talent war before with COVID. That's kind of changed, I would say, last year. But based on this data, I would say this will somehow start again. But it will be probably on pockets and, and specific areas like we're, we're seeing with cyber and data. But you have a lot of additional spend that is coming in those areas, and there will need to be skills. So in terms of how and what's the strategy that tech leaders are, are taking to source this talent. Um, we can see that, uh, and probably this a bit of a difference between uh, Australia and, and uh, other regions. So uh, six in 10 are committed to building internal resources uh, and, and training, which is, it's great news, right? Uh, it is still quite a strong challenge, right, to, to deal with. Outsourcing will be the second option. Right, uh, to, to consider. And this is where we see a difference with other uh, uh, regions. So we see Australia is more open to outsourcing than other regions on average. And uh, then 
you have four out of 10 are saying that they will be either hiring for specialists when they go to market or trying to get a generalist and get that flexibility that you can get with a generalist, right? So that's pretty much on par. Now, uh, only 7.7% are saying that they don't face any uh, staffing shortage, which, which is extremely low. So you can see uh, there might be a bit of a, a talent war uh, in, in the future uh, based on this data because it's uh, yeah headcount increase and very few are not having an issue at the moment. Uh, in terms of hybrid work, and, and this is probably the the part that uh, I would link this to that HRIS component that we discussed before. So uh, a bit hard to read this, and this is just showing a uh, percentage of remote workforce is this X axis here. And then the, re the replies are how many people are placing themselves on that category. Um, we didn't ask questions specifically about uh, how many days per week people are going to the office or things that are a bit more granular, maybe something to consider for the future and building uh, if that's something of interest. But in general, what we're seeing is seven out of 10 leaders uh, have 40% or more of their workforce. So this three bars combined, right? So more than 40%, that's seven out of 10. And then uh, four out of 10 will be in these two bars that are 60% or more, right? So there's a significant portion of the workforce. It's not, not a, again, not a surprise, but uh, it, it does present some challenges. And, and I think uh, part of our lessons learned, everyone, I guess, uh, in terms of the pandemic and how that, that came to be and how, it, uh, how things ended up working. Um, First, it's not it's it's not too hard to get BAU done remotely, and you can see how you can still perform. Um, it is easier to be one hundred percent remote from an operations point of view and engagement and, and collaboration. Uh, if it's one hundred percent remote or it's one hundred percent in the office, hybrid is very tough, right? So, how do you join meetings like you probably uh, are facing today that you will be on a meeting room? There will always be someone who's connecting remotely. How do you engage with with that uh, with that cohort that is not sitting in the same room, or uh, if it's the other way around, everyone is online and they have other tools at hand, and maybe two or three are sitting on a meeting room, they might be missing out. So, the challenge is there, and how do you um, engage with people that are now hybrid? That's probably the the hardest combination of of uh, of where to be, and what are the needs for it from an e-learning, uh, employee climate uh, measurement, collaboration tools, ideation tools? So innovation is something very hard to do if you're fully remote. Um, so whiteboards and, and, and the likes, video conferencing devices. All of that is probably one of the challenges. And I, I would link that to that HRAS and HR tools, uh, which is probably yeah, how to engage with this hybrid workforce as a theme, you know, as something uh, a bit of a challenge. Uh, and lastly, there was this, uh, so the in terms of um, planning on changing this profile, saying, well, we, we will go fully to the office or, or something different. In the case of a recession, uh, even in that case, there was no indication that people were planning on changing this. So this is here to stay. And it's, well, how do I, to adapt to this and, and think about all that talent that will need to be recruited and trained, as we saw, 60% uh, are considering, well, retraining and upskilling as a strategy, talking of, of IT skills. Uh, so how do you do that in this environment that is hybrid? So with that, I'll just uh, do a bit of a recap here. <clears throat> so we went through uh, some of the data were around uh, um, driving business outcomes or reducing costs so that uh, lower maturity level uh, that was two thirds of respondents were in that in that place. So keep that in mind. Digital transformation and cyber being top priorities, uh, but with a new context in, in play. So think about the, the concerns about regulation, government and industry regulation and rising customer expectations as, as a theme. So in, in that context, uh, we have IT budgets and headcounts that are increasing. But 
I would just consider the variation between industries, right? So it's not the same for everyone. Some cases it might be quite significantly different too. Uh, so just be mindful of that. And, and well, you need to fully understand the context of who you're talking to, to, to get a, a good uh, gauge into this. Uh, AI remains a, a main uh, focus of new spending. So there will be probably that's, that will be very high in the list of new net new spend. Uh, cloud cyber are the, the main areas of increased spending. We also saw the low code APIs and that modernization and transformation that we need as, as a theme there too and, and investment there. And then from a, a talent point of view, it's that, uh, well, how to, how to attract and retain and most importantly, probably train this talent. So you need to upskill uh, people to address this shortage of talent that we will have. Um, and then uh, that in the context of this hybrid work environment. So considering you need to do all these things, train, retain, uh, get people into a new culture uh, and onboard no, new employees in the context of hybrid work environments, which are, uh, of course, a, a challenge. So in terms of IT suppliers and, uh, and partners, just keep th that in mind and remember that uh, the decision-making process uh, is heavily relying on that uh, closeness and understanding of the business. Uh, that's a very significant theme. As we said, 65%, if you consider data sovereignty being a local player and understanding the business, right? So uh, just you need to fully understand that business. That is probably the, the best investment you can do in terms of uh, yeah uh, being more successful. So that's uh, pretty much it. I went quite fast, uh, Simon, but well, that leaves more time for questions. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Eduardo. And look, there's some fantastic questions in the chat. We've got... Um, We've got plenty of time to have a really great conversation uh, and, get, and we'll get through those questions. Um, just, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I took a number of notes there just to sort of um, come back to you on. Um, the maturity model is right up front was really interesting. Um, and it talked about, you know, this sort of 25% are in that transform and expand category, 23% optimize uh, and 51% are in that support struggle category. Yeah. Um, it's it's a bit of a bit eye opening, but if you talked about the data governance and AI adoption ready piece, there's only any is there only twenty five percent? Was the optimized category cover that those organisations that can adopt AI and be ready? And and does that extend to cyber? So they're fifty one percent in that support struggle piece. Are they not ready to adopt AI? And then are they not ready to be um, leveraging our latest and greatest cyber security tools? So it, it does apply to a bit of everything. So when we, so one of the, the models that we have, and it's uh, it's a mix of something that is somewhat uh, enhanced by Infotech, but it's the COVID framework, right? And that covers 45 different IT processes, basically. And, and that's uh, a lot has to do with assessing all those processes. So this is a bit of a compendium of all of that, but it's not it's not data driven in the sense that people, when they're answering this question, it's where they see themselves. So that's a description and it covers a bit of everything. So as a CIO, IT leader, where, where would you place yourself? And we use that also when we discuss with, with CEOs and CFOs and COOs. So part of what we do is also getting some diagnostics and work with the business counterparts where, where do they see you, right? So it's both ways. And it's just, a data point and it's yeah. triggering that conversation. So that's a, the main, just so you understand this is uh, where, where do you think you are now where you might be struggling I, and it could be slightly different because it's not, it's not science in that sense. It's where do you see yourself? Some might say, well, maybe they're, they're really advanced in, let's say it could be a Microsoft platform and they could be fully in, uh, embracing that and they have everything uh, that they can in that sense, and they're struggling maybe with the back office or the ERP. Right? So they might say, well, I'm not there yet because of the ERP. Well, maybe they can still do AI in that case, right? So it doesn't mean that you can do something. So this is a like, kind of a very broad average, let's say. Now, uh, that generalization of, okay, you might be struggling with AI. What we did see with some of the respondents on our other um, survey, the global one that we do on tech trends, um, 
when you see the the ones that are struggling still with the, the basic, the plumbing of IT, let's say, uh, they can still do a lot of strategies that are niche in terms of AI, right? So it doesn't mean that you can't do AI because you don't have all the bells and whistles on the platforms, right? It will be a bit harder to do a company-wide AI thing, right? That, that might take a bit more work, right? But you can still do a lot of niche uh, and kind of very specific AI solutions and the same with cyber, right? I think cyber, other than the dependencies with networks and other kind of basic infrastructure that could be, you could be struggling with those, you can always do a lot of cyber also on specific areas, right? So uh, there's tools, as you know, in cyber, as much as you can eat, right? But uh, if you want to do something specific on cyber, there's always somewhere that you can still grow and, and, and move ahead. Uh, it will just be easier for someone who's already well-established. That's the way I would put it, right? So if you're already transforming your business models with a, with the, your business stakeholders, right? Uh, probably you have all the basics in place and it's just, well, turning something on and boom, you have AI working for many, many right. use cases, right? So it's easier. doesn't mean that you can't do it. Got it. Um you said something really interesting that piqued my interest um, around ERP investments uh, are back on the radar. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, a couple of things. We saw the the three year digital transformation anecdote happen in three months of COVID a number of years ago, and probably seen a bit of a, a drop off in spend. It might, as you can see, it might be coming back in relation to tech legacy investment. Is a, I'm just wondering, is a drive? You've got any data or any conversations you're having? Is the driver for some of the ERP, ERP conversations? is because there's quite these innovative and maturing SaaS models that are in the market for uh, segments of ERP or across the ERP platforms. For example, um, you know, some of these HR platforms that are now coming out of the North America are now being supported in Australia. Um, are they sort of becoming more attractive as a, uh, to a sort of some of the legacy ERP? And do you have any sort of insights in there as to what's going on? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the there's an elephant in the room that has some sunset and change in their product offering, right? And that's probably the the big movement taking place. But that's driving a lot of decisions that need to, to be accelerated because of that, right? So the time is kind of running up, up for making a decision in 2027, right? You need some time to prepare, right? Now that means upgrading to the new version, right? Or making a different decision. Uh, and in those decisions, today's definition of an ERP, as you say, well, it's not that simple, right? And and there's so many ways to define ERP today, right? It used to be that would usually be 80 to maybe 90% of your processes would be in that box, right? And maybe 15 years ago, right? Today, probably it's it's not, but it's still very key because it is your source of truth for tons of things, right? So um, I would say it's it's now being redefined and people will be kind of maybe considering other platforms that could be moving a bit more into that ERP space too. Some are actually offering, as you say, you know, HR from the HR side, you, you can actually have an ERP, right? Uh, some of those platforms. Uh, it used to be something on the CRM side too. I'm not not sure that went ahead, but you can you can now redefine and say, well, what is the the anchor here? And depending on the business that you're at, it might be slightly different, right? If you're a, a people's business, right? Well, maybe you could be closer to that end. So I think those SaaS offerings are changing a bit of the the answer to this. Well, we need to make a decision. There's a cliff, right? Somehow we need to make a decision. I think it will be a bit surprising on what the answer is, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, and then also it's uh, maybe needing a more a smaller core ERP. What we're seeing with many clients is, okay, maybe I can keep the lights on with the ones that don't have maybe one of the big brands, right? It's well, can you ring fence that ERP and and keep it running that just for the the commodity side of things of the ERP, and then modernize around it. And maybe you have something different, right? So, and that's where microservices, low code, no code options are are there, right? So, it's not easy. I think it was easier, easier, it's easier in the past. Fascinating <laughs> yeah. area to watch. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, 
uh, that, that tech legacy debt, you're particularly seeing it, some of that ERP transition to cloud. And I think, as you said, the conversations with CEOs and CFOs is always, always a tough one around ERP because uh, yeah, it's got the it's, hidden, hidden operational benefits, right? Rather. Yeah, especially, well, depending on the... Uh, what what's their thinking more my experience with with multinationals that you usually have in a in a market or a region you have a ceo that comes for uh, i don't know three years and then we'll move on to another region or market so uh, and i had that experience many times over when they come in and they are kind of faced with a turn well it's your turn to do the upgrade of the erp then they hate it right they say can can't we push this back <laughs> <laughs> Two three years, I'll be gone. Right? Can someone? And if your else... government, you'll do a five year <laughs> ERP transformation. Wonder why it goes wrong halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there's some questions in relation to breakdown <clears throat> of survey data uh, by industry and things. You touched on, um, you know, if I was, uh, you know, an AWA member in the tech industry selling the government, I might be quite happy because you talked about they've got the biggest increases in budget, um, but education sort of in the surveys coming up is is yeah is really la lagging and, and industries perhaps some growth but not as much as government so can you provide any any further insights as to perhaps where um and there's some questions from from people on the webinar as to any further insights in relation to uh, what you're seeing by different industry sectors yeah so on budget and that's the main one probably right so it budget i'm seeing now um <clears throat> Yeah, so you do see on other industries probably that higher section of 30% plus, right? So to get to that 30% plus, it is slightly bigger, that section, with other industries. So we had three boxes here, just make it relevant. So we have education, government, and other industries. So basically uh, commercial, right, or private. So that segment is zero for education. 10% for government and 17% for other. So probably on other industries, you will still be seeing that some are really growing fast. Now, the the main section that is the uh, 10 to 29% increase, so still extremely high, that's 50% for government compared to 43 with others, right? And 20 education, right? So that's a, the latter, right? So what you see in the average, the average for that section is 42 government is 50 so it's above the the average um now probably we did discuss it once that might be going backwards which is small but it's not zero right um now education is not going backwards so no one said decrease right so they said 40 percent, no change 40 percent, one to nine percent and 20 percent 10 to 29. So no decrease, which is would be alarming if it's a there's a decrease. And uh, you only see some decrease on, on other industries, basically. But the government also in some areas has is marking 10% in government are saying 1% to 9% decrease. And, and I think we know some of those agencies that are kind of compensating for increases somewhere else. And IT would be one of those, right? That is helping you know, yeah. with that bu those budgets. So yeah, I think that context and reading that context before any discussion will be key because it could be in a very different place, right? If you're talking to that 10% that is needs to reduce 5% maybe of the budget, yeah, very different so, conversation. So speaking of budgets, you, you, you talk about additional spend of uh, technology budgets, 73% um, going to cyber, and then you talk about new spend um, and the most the biggest area is on AI, but... Their percentages. So I'm just wondering, is additional spend um, going to solve? Is that a bigger number of the additional spend bucket rather as opposed to new spend? Um, so does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, I don't think we have the data to quantify. Is it, I don't know, net new spend, uh, you're saying it's 28% are saying that. Well, now, is, net, is, is that... new spend 100 million yeah. versus Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't million. think... That's kind of what I'm trying to understand. I don't yeah. think I have that data. Oh. But let me let me just quickly check if there's something, maybe a different way to see that that could be explained. What I'm trying to get to is is, is the investment on AI. So how, how relevant is that? Is it, yeah, is so how a big it's... number still. Yeah. Probably in Australia, I'm guessing. Yeah. So probably it's... Uh... 
Well, it it depends also on on how and how you define this. So one thing that is the, the obvious one that everyone's discussing with one of the big vendors, it's just turning something on and getting, you no, know, something on AI, right? The, just off the shelf. That's pretty much what everyone that is on this platform is trialing to some extent. Now that's quite expensive per user. So depending on how much you want to do that, that could be just a very quick uh, shift in your spend in, a, in AI without much effort, basically, right? So you need to put some governance around it and off you go. Uh, I can't find that. That's okay. Still yeah, good. Quanti put you on the spot on that quantifiable. That. No, no, that's fine. We, we can take a look, but I don't think we had that. It's more how many people are seeing an increase in where. They're not saying how much. Yeah, no, that's fine. Just going to some of the Q&A questions. Um, there's one here. Cyber is a broad area. Are there any details that can be shared, whether it is focused on software or services or something else? If any or all of these, uh, any details of what the focus will be by industry? So just any more breakdown on cyber as a, as a you know, an increased area of spend, what areas of cyber? Um, there was one on adoption that had a bit more granularity. So it's not spend, but it's adoption, expected adoption, right? Then... There's an index there. So let me see if that had. Um... No, because that's user facing. So there's nothing on specifically on, on cyber. I can't find anything specifically on cyber and, and breaking that down. I oh, know no, you do. There is breakdown in the report around cloud AI automation. Um, yes, but, so there is there is segmentation. But if you, but if you um, want cyber, you want cyber in more detail specifically. That was the question. Is there any yeah. sort of further information as to what constitutes cyber in the minds of the CIOs when they answered the the, the, the question about where they're spending the areas? So whether that's from um, um, perhaps it's more anecdotal. If you've got any anecdotal insights as to perhaps what's Driving them. I know what the driver, I mean, it's in the report. Right? Yeah. It's one of the driving yeah. policies. So, in terms of, yeah, so just what I'm seeing in, in cyber is probably in e every everywhere. So, all the, the sections, but I would say from a services point of view, it's uh, SOC and how do you have a, a strong SOC operation, especially with these threats coming up and anything that will be addressing uh, sophisticated AI threats right so ai cyber threats and how to uh have more machine learning embedded there so endpoint security with machine learning a endpoint security is probably a big area that you want something you can't be waiting for uh, the signature to come in and updating everything needs to be smart let's say right so yeah endpoint SOC probably are two but uh it's yeah the tooling is infinite Right. So I think then it's just pacing yourself and then it's assessing, well, your, your maturity too. So uh, mm -hmm. essential aid being something that is now the thing, right. To, to address is just going through that and understanding where you're probably weak or weaker and, and going through that and, and just decide. Uh, yeah, look, that's right. And, and there's an anecdote from um, just from the AAA land. We lost our head of policy last year to uh uh, one of the major retailers in this country, um, uh, supermarket retailers. And because they're um, arguably, uh, of course, it's a private list, systems of national significance, <laughs> right, um, under Soki Sons. And so they're required now to do all this reporting. So they've had to hire a massive headcount in order just to do the reporting against the Soki Sons and the cybersecurity legislation. So there is a cost impost um, both in hiring people and IT budgets in order to comply. So I think you're probably seeing, to answer the question, costs occurring, as you say, in the um, in the um, secure operation centers, um, in, but also in reporting and governance. Reporting and governance, yeah. So, and, and that's, I think, linking that to that government regulation and cyber, that combination of the two, that's yeah. probably, yeah, explosive, let's say, right? So, there's some interesting questions here, a couple of questions um, around, uh, I guess, the workforce sort of transformation hybrid um, conversation, which is actually, we're seeing that actively play out in the papers at the moment um, about where the world's going and particularly with the public sector um, approach. Um, 
so just sort of reflecting on that, I don't know if there's anything, any got any further reflections, but when we went to the US delegation that we hosted back in November, we went to some of the biggest global tech companies in the world, um, Microsoft, Amazon, et al. Um, and what was really interesting is that they're sort of transitioning back to, from full remote back to hybrid uh, as their preferred model. And this really came down to, to your point, um, BAU remotely still works for many functional roles um, or technical roles, but these these companies are really focused on innovation as well in, inside their tech companies. They want to con yeah. constantly innovate, um, ideate and innovate. And they find that that's better done through cross-functional teams. And in order to get cross-functional teams, so you've actually got to come together at some point. Yeah. So they're really moving back to that hybrid world so they can, can continue to innovate products and services um, as, as IT people. So have you sort of you sort of seeing, I think the data sort of shows that there's hybrid is probably preferred and is not, um, is there any trend data um, in, in, in what you're seeing? <laughs> Uh, no, I think it was quite uh, stable, right? But it's uh, it, it's more the themes, and maybe something we should be just trying to get is those themes. So, what are the, how are you struggling, or what what are the struggles with uh, dealing with that? Not understanding where the pain points. Um, so, with uh, and just my previous role, I was uh, in, in advertising and just creative agencies and how they need to innovate, right? Uh, but also depending on the stages of your workforce too, right? And that was an industry with very young people, probably first time, first jobs, right? That, that they had were there. So getting, it's not just onboarding, it's just getting someone to to work for the first time, right? Understanding the basics. So on the job training, for example, just explaining someone how to work it's not natural to do that. You can be all day on a Zoom call with someone trying to explain how to do things, right? So onboarding new people, especially if they're very young, right? It will be very hard to do. And, um, and innovation, so that creation, so not keeping things going, but creating something brand new, that's where that was really hard to do, really hard to do. So you can see that, yeah, it was keeping the lights on, but then things weren't really happening from kind of creation of, of new stuff. So that will be probably the, the main driver for many of these companies to reassess and have yeah, more presence. You can see it everywhere. Everyone that maybe went a bit too far with promising you can work for, from wherever, forever, basically. And they need to now kind of go back yeah. to that it's state. It probably, it probably depends on the roles and the functions and that innovation. Yeah. But as a country, we need to do more. We've got to do more innovation rather than just uh, operations. Yeah. So, uh, there's a term I heard in the in the US from one of the big multinationals, which was two two pizza teams, um, which is essentially I think 10, 10 people is the magic number in terms of cross functional teams. Yeah, uh, because obviously two pizzas is what you need to feed them when they probably stay back to eight o'clock at night. So uh, it was really interesting. Um, just a couple of questions here. Um, not sure if the data um, goes to it or you can reflect on it in, in through your. Um, engagements with companies. Um, in addition to cyber being broad, cloud is also broad. Um, can you please clarify how spend is skewed towards SaaS, public cloud from AWS, Azure, or Google, or private cloud, brackets VMware, or in-house cloud services? So is there any sense as to what cloud is um, from the context of the spend to cloud? Not with the questions we have. So the, the actual result for that was uh, when we describe cloud is cloud and between brackets, we have IS, PaaS and SaaS. So it's all bundled together. So unfortunately, no, probably something worthwhile expanding as we, we continue with the index because it, yeah, it is especially SaaS as opposed to, so are you talking infrastructure somehow or applications? I think probably that will be a good split for the future. Yeah. Good question. We can segment that out for the future. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, are there any further questions? Please put them in the chat. Otherwise, I think we're we're close to time. Um, I don't have any sort of other. I thought it was a fantastic presentation. There's so much data in it. And I'll come to that in a moment. Um, uh, so let me now switch to closing out. And I'll share my my closing slides. Um, hopefully, everyone can see that. Um, so it was really the, a, a great first you know, inaugural report. Um, we will refine it um, based upon 
your questions um, and really aim to do this twice a year and then actually determine as an index a shift in sentiment as to where people are purchasing uh, or attending to purchase over the short term. So in other words, the next 12 months. I know the feedback from members as to why we, we do this, wouldn't it be great to understand what our customers are planning to do in the next 12 months to 24 months rather than three and five year horizons, which are just too far out for people to really uh, be able to impact and shape. People want to know where people's budgets are now. And that's what this index is attempting to do. So you can drive your activities uh, as salespeople or as organisations trying to um, you know, support the Australian market and your customers. Um, so it looks at priority uh, for corporate tech projects. Um, it does have state um, some state segmentation uh, as well in there, in the full report. Um, how those buying decisions are determined. Um, and Wado talked a bit about that, which I think is really, really important around um, what they want from a partner, from a tech, um, a tech supplier in terms of um, you know, who they will choose. Skills demand and headcount changes are also covered. Um, of course, budgets uh, and areas of disruption. Obviously, we talked a lot about that today. Um, so this is the uh, the contents of the full report. Um, and obviously, it, there's a lot there. Uh, you'll, you can see the level of detail that is in the full report. We just sort of glossed over, I guess, the highlights today. Um, but it does include the disruptions facing the CIOs, namely cyber, changing customer behaviour and government policy. Uh, it does cover the, where the new tech spend is, AI, no-code, low-code, and robotic processes being the top three. Um, and additional tech spend, cyber APIs, cloud data management solutions. Um, so, you know, if you are interested, you can see um, the scope of the report there in the, the contents that you would get if you wish to purchase the whole report. And we have got it heavily discounted um, and for AWA members. Um, so please contact Gabrielle at awa.com.au for more information if you wish to get a copy of the report. This, there's more information on at the AWA website um, in relation to uh, the report. Uh, gives a few more highlights. Some of those slides and some of that data um, is on the website um, under uh, the AWA Tech Index page. So please have a look there. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure um, to, to uh, host you, Ed. And thank you for taking us through that. Thank you for all thank the you. questions and the engagement uh, from uh, the people on the webinar. And this is recorded and it will be made available in the member portal uh, tomorrow. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Simon.